in, in the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. This is just an amazing time to think about all the things that happened. I, I started writing these books about the Apollo program. It's been about six years ago now. Uh, it was a labor of love for me to do that. And um, it was not anything I intended to do, but I kind of fell into it. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that, that worked as, as we go through this. But for me, it's just amazing. You know, when people say like, well, you know, uh, we didn't have computers back then. The moon landings must have been faked. Let me show you how we actually did things back then before we had, and we did have computers. And let me show you how that actually worked. And the, uh, the miracles that putting a lot of smart people to work with a, with a goal, give them, give them all the money they want, and give them a very short time frame, and it's amazing what people can do. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about that. I want to take you first back to Jan uh, July 24th, 1950. There was a, a young boy um, who was fishing in the, uh, the Banana River south of Cape Canaveral, and he heard this weird fishing sound, uh, this word, weird whooshing sound, and he saw a smoke trail going up through the sky. And the next day, he saw that what he witnessed was the first rocket launch from Kennedy from from Cape Canaveral. This was Bumper uh, Bumper Eight, which was a modified V2 rocket with a second stage on there. He'd seen this. This was the first launch from Cape Canaveral, this 11-year-old boy saw. Uh, 19 years later, that boy was in the firing room at Kennedy Space Center for the launch of Apollo 11. He was one of the engineers manning the, uh, the, the console for the, the third stage of the Saturn V rocket. So just in the, in the short period of time for that young boy to go from fishing in the river from the first launch to seeing Americans uh, take off to go to the moon was just an incredible experience for him. Um, this is a story about that, that journey. You know, if you, if you think about where we were when, when John F. Kennedy issued his challenge to the nation in, um, in May of, of 1961, uh, uh, Cape Canaveral was that green area on the right-hand side of the screen there. That was the Air Force Station, and you can see the little, um, uh, you can see the, the launch pads are all along here. Uh, uh, Alan Shepard took off from here. This whole area, after Kennedy issued his challenge, it was determined the uh, NASA went around and, and tried to do a real quick site to figure out where they could launch from. This whole white area is Kennedy Space Center. This was all bought and built in the course of about four years. This whole area was all orange groves and uh, recreational area. The government bought that, turned it into what, what turned out to be the largest, uh, one of the largest civil engineering program since the construction of the Panama Canal. That's the scale of building Kennedy Space Center in a very, very short period of time. So Kennedy is, issues his challenge in May of 1961. This is a picture from September of 1965 of the Gemini 11 launch. And you can see it's only four and a half years later. There's a Saturn V sitting on a launch pad in the background there that didn't even exist. And, uh, the, the Saturn V had never been designed. Kennedy Space Center had not been designed and constructed. The Gemini program wasn't even on the drawing board when Kennedy issued his challenge. That's the pace at which we were innovating and, and, and building up to send Americans to the moon. So again, this is um, just an incredible amount of progress in, in four and a half short years. Uh, how was it done? A lot of it was done with the first uh, sets of uh, Pert charting and things like that. So this is uh, one of the original test supervisors for the Apollo program with one of his uh, Pert charts for one of the early missions. What they would do every day is after they did the schedule meetings, they'd take these magnetic boards down, take them over to the photo lab, they'd have pictures taken of them, and then those pictures would be developed and handed out as the schedules for the next day's meeting. So no computerized scheduling, all done with magnetic stuff and photographs. But that's, they kept a very clear uh, schedule of what was going on, and that was part of the, the, the criteria for success. <coughs> I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, one of the things that I saw in, in going through and doing the research for this was, was how did we actually go about building these rockets and putting them together? I'd seen lots of pictures of, you know, here's, here's them uh, stacking part of the Saturn V in one of these big buildings. But I never knew how all this stuff fit together, and that's part of what led to, to writing this book about Kennedy Space Center. There were basically there were two parts of the moon rocket here in the very center, the Saturn V. On the left-hand side, you have the Apollo spacecraft, which is the command and the service module. Those were built by uh, Nor uh, excuse me, built by Rockwell, 
and then the, the lunar module built by Grumman. And on the right-hand side, you had the, the main part of the Saturn V rocket, the first stage built by Boeing, the second stage built by Rockwell, and the third stage built by McDonnell Douglas. And so you had all these contractors working on building the spacecraft side or building the launch vehicle side. One of the things that I didn't appreciate in doing this was how much NASA was divided, even at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, it still is today. It was really interesting to find out, okay, you had um, the, the, the folks that built Kennedy Space Center, the original launch team came from Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. The people who were managing the spacecraft were all tied to Houston. So you had you, Houston people and you had Marshall people, and there was a natural kind of, of rivalry between these two groups of people. And uh, neither side really kind of kept touch of what the other side was doing because they were so busy working on their, on their own sections. But we're going to talk first about what happened uh, when, when all of these things came together from, at Cape Kennedy or Cape Canaveral, they'd all been built in other places around the country, and they were sent to the Kennedy Space Center in, in boxes and in, in parts. And so it took about six months from the time everything arrived at Kennedy Space Center until they launched a mission. So the spacecraft came in on, on an airplane that was called the Super Guppy, and it's still flying right now. It's a modified airplane. The entire thing is, is hollow inside. And it's, it's, at this time, it was the time it was built. This was the largest aircraft in the world, and it was used to fly in uh, both the spacecraft and then one of these smaller stages, or a couple of the smaller stages of the uh, of the launch vehicle. So here is the lunar module for Apollo 9 arriving in the Super Guppy. Uh, you can just see it's coming in a box, flying out of uh, out of Bethpage in, in New York, and then the command and service module also coming in in, in crates. Uh, they fly into the strip at, at Kennedy's at uh, Cape Canaveral, and they'd be carted over to a building. Uh, another, uh, this is something I never knew before. Uh, before doing the research on this book, was that the the air the part of the adapter that that housed the spacecraft was flown in from Wichita, Kansas, by helicopter. So and dropped off in the parking lot of the assembly building. So again, it's kind of a high tech uh, way that things were done. So uh, a building that, that gets very little notice from most of us is this building that was called the, at this time it was called the Manned Spacecraft Operations Building. It's now called the Operations and Checkout Building, or the ONC Building. And this is where the spacecraft was put together. And it's in several, several different parts. Uh, so you've got this area here. There's a lot of offices in here. This is, uh, on the far left-hand side, is the area where the spacecraft was assembled. And then there's offices in here. The astronaut crew quarters are up here. This is where the astronauts come and sleep. Even, even in the, uh, the, the shuttle program, this is, this is where the astronauts have their rest the day before they go out to the launch pad. And when you see them walk out to the, the transfer van, that's down in this little alleyway down there. So this is the astronauts' home away from home when they're, when they're in from Houston. And that building is still in use today. Right now, it's, lo it's uh, licensed to uh, Lockheed Martin, and they're building the Orion spacecraft in there. This was what the layout of that building looked like. Uh, I talked to the gentleman that was in charge of laying out this building. And uh, and he was saying, you know, at the time that this was issued, OK, we're going to build this, this building where the spacecraft is going to be assembled. He said, OK, what's the spacecraft look like? Well, we don't really know. How big is it going to be? I don't know. So he's so to try to figure out how to, how big to make this building, he had three guys lie down on the floor and figure out, okay, if there's three people flying in an Apollo spacecraft, it's gotta be about that big around to make room for these three people. And then he worked from there to try to figure out about what size this building should be. So again, this is this is kind of like the hurry up and build a thing. And he happened to build it the right size, uh, to, to, to uh, assign it the right size when it was initially uh, and this is again one of those things to think about. When we initially thought about going to the moon, we weren't even quite sure how we were going to get there. The original thought was we were going to launch a spacecraft straight to the moon, land it on the surface, and fly that same spacecraft back. And that was before we figured out how to build a lunar module and do orbit rendezvous and things like that. So he had designed this, assuming this was going to be like a 50 or 60 foot tall rocket. And it turned out he needed that, they needed that much room, but that was the way this was designed. So this is the way that when they start uh, unwrapping the Christmas present, this is what the command and service module for Apollo looks like when it comes in. And then this is uh, the lunar module coming in, wrapped up nicely. Uh, again, it would, it would show up like this. The original idea uh, that, that uh, Marshall Space Flight Center said with, with Kennedy is like, 
we're going to do what they call ship and shoot. We're going to just ship you the rocket, you put it out in the launch pad and shoot it off. And what happened, of course, was it took six months of testing and integration and all of that stuff to put all this together. It turned out to be a lot more complex than just turning a couple wrenches and hooking up the fuel pipes. Uh, so here's the altitude chambers, and these were, these were operated by Bendix. And they're still there today, but they're not being used. But the one on the left was used for the command and service module, and then the one on the right was used for the lunar module. And what they would do is they would, they would after they, they initially unboxed these things, they'd lower the spacecraft in there and assemble them inside the altitude chambers and then run the tests inside there. So here's, uh, this is uh, Apollo 11 is coming out of one of the uh, altitude chambers right now. This is Apollo 12 about to go into the, the altitude chamber. One of the th things I also didn't appreciate when I was, was doing the research for this book was the intense pressure after, you know, we had that Apollo 1 fire in 1967, which kind of stopped the program launches for, for a little bit more than a year and a half. Um, we had, from 1968 to the end of 1969, we had that much time to try to get everybody going. We had, at any one time, there were three missions being assembled and tested at the same time at Kennedy Space Center. One was usually out of the launch pad, one was in the vehicle assembly building, and one was being put together here in the, in the operations and checkout building. So you, at, at any one time, you had people working on three different, or people could have been working on one of three different missions at the same time. You know, the, the, the goal was Apollo 11 was going to launch in July of that year. If Apollo 11 didn't make it, Apollo 12 was going to be ready to launch in September of that year. If Apollo 12 didn't make it, Apollo 13 was going to go in November that year. We had three shots at the moon in the last half of 1969. Uh, this is a, a color picture of uh, one of the uh, command modules being lowered into the altitude chamber here. This is the altitude chamber. This is the lid for it. They just, they would use a crane to pick up the lid and set it down on posts on top of the altitude, or the other altitude chamber. Uh, the guy, I, you know, I asked the guy, did they like bolt it down or how did they keep the lid on the altitude? Well, of course, when they suck the air out, it's gonna be pressed down in there, but he said when we did a rapid Repressurization, the thing would kind of like bubble like a uh, like a lid on a big stove pot, except the thing weighs like 40 or 50 tons. So this one's being lowered in. The service module is already inside the altitude chamber, and they're about to lower that in to, to be stacked on top of it. So here's the inside of the altitude chamber now, and you can see uh, the astronauts are coming in for a test. And you've got these platforms all around that can be lowered down so that people can can uh, do instrumentation and things like that. Uh, instruments and check out. What they would do is they you know, put the astronauts inside, seal it up. They could run uh, simulations in in, uh, in in no no air conditions or, or no atmosphere conditions or other types of things. Uh, it was a it was a clean room type of environment. Everybody had to wear booties and and, and things to go inside there. Uh, one of the people told me at one time they saw uh, a cockroach skittering into the into the command module, and they, they never did actually find the cockroach. They found a couple of the legs from it, but they never found the, uh, the rest of the cockroach before the mission. And uh, on the way back from the moon, Pete Conrad held up this card, and he said, we found your cockroach. And it was actually it was a, rubber, a rubber roach he'd taken with him. <laughs> so, Conrad was a great jokester in that, that regard. Um, one of the other things they did in, in the altitude chambers was this was the only time that the command and service module, I mean, the command module and the lunar module would meet before they got into outer space. So the command module had been built out in Downey, California. The lunar module had been built in, in, in uh, Bethpage at, at Grumman's facility. So the command module was sitting in the bottom of this chamber, and now they're lowering in the top of the lunar module to see if the two of them, the two of them are going to be compatible. Well, well there will actually be a docking test. So here's the lunar module being lowered down on top of the, the command module. And they'd have the guys get inside and make sure that the latch is latched. And then they pull the, the, the probe out. And then they also practice vacuum testing to make sure there was no leak. But if it didn't work right here, it was not going to work right on the way to the moon. And you didn't want to find that out when you were uh, a couple hundred thousand miles away from home. So they would, they would check that out, and they'd pull the, the lunar module back out and put it together in its own altitude chamber. And when the lunar module came out, then they would, they would uh, they put in a special stand for putting the legs on it. So here's some of the uh, technicians installing and testing the, uh, the spring-loaded legs of the lunar module. 
Another piece that was also late, uh, that came relatively late, was the Lunar Rover, and these were built in, in Alabama. And uh, so here's a, a test of, of two of the astronauts using the suits they're going to wear on the moon in the lunar rover, and the lunar module is in the background here. They're testing the communications between their suits and the lunar rover's communication and the lunar module. Again, the first time these pieces have all come, come together. One of the things that amazed me was looking at the back of the lunar module here. This is after it's already gone through its altitude chamber testing. How, how much of the insulation is still off of that. It's still very much open. The lunar module was this open framework kind of thing, and it just had uh, lots of layers of gold and, and silver foil added over top of it. Uh, at, in a lot of cases, it was added at the launch pad. So this is what it looked like while it was being tested. And after they were sure everything was working together, they would lower the lunar module into a ring uh, in a test platform. Again, these, uh, these uh, floors are being were lowered around it. The lunar module is lowered into there. Again, the back of it was, was not complete at the time. These are all the batteries that where the batteries go that, that power the, the uh, ascent module. So um, that's all I added out at the launch pad later on. But uh, so now they lower, this is the part that came in from Wichita by helicopter. They lower that down over the lunar module. And now the command module was coming out. They add the engine bell to it and the antenna to it in a special stand. And then they lower that down on top of it. And so you've got a nice little package of the command service module and the, and the spacecraft all bundled up. So this is, uh, this is actually the Apollo 1 capsule. This is the one that, it, that, uh, that the fire happened in. But this is rolling out of the operations and checkout building. They just roll the whole thing out in a truck and either take it out to the launch pad for the early Apollo missions or take it to the vehicle assembly building. So now, so now they roll the spacecraft over to the vehicle assembly building. What they did in later missions was they wrapped the whole thing up in, in, uh, in it looks like it's in a cocoon, but that was protected from the weather until they could get it out to uh, where it's going to be protected at the launch pad. They had these other dummy uh, boilerplate spacecraft here that they used to, as, as weight and balance checks on the Saturn project. They, as I said, they were stacking three missions at the same time, so they would use these temporary boiler, boiler plates to, as uh, uh, placeholders until the actual spacecraft arrived. So we're, we were talking about the vehicle assembly building, and this is, this is it. This was. Um, at the time, the largest building in the state of Florida, it was, uh, it's still the largest single-story building in the world. It's uh, 545 feet high. Uh, you, can, you can stand on the inside and look straight up 500-some feet. Uh, you know, there's, there's stories that, that uh, it's so big that, that uh, clouds can accumulate in the top, and people have said that they felt rain inside there before. Um, Vultures like to get in there, and they have a, a fun time. Somebody was telling me about the fun time of trying to capture vultures and take them down in the high-speed elevator, which the vultures do not like, and, and they usually tend to vomit on their way down in the elevator. It's uh, the glamorous jobs that they had at, uh, at Kennedy Space Center. But this is what the inside of the VAB looked like. There were four high bays. So at first, when this was built, the idea was they were going to be assembling four different rockets at the same time. What, when Apollo was originally proposed, Werner von Braun thought it was going to take probably 30 to 40 launches a year to get us to the moon. And that number turned out to be obviously a lot fewer than that. But, but that, again, was, was kind of what he was budgeting for. So the, the rocket stages come into this low bay area here, and they're checked out, and then they're brought into this high bay where they're stacked up. And uh, each of those, there's, there are four launcher, or there, they were actually only used three of those rings during Apollo. Each of those high bays is big enough to hold the Statue of Liberty and its, its full base. So you can have four Statues of Liberty inside there and still have plenty of extra room on top of that. So the, the, uh, the rockets came in by barge after being tested in Mississippi and Huntsville. They were wheeled over. This is the second stage being wheeled over. Um, this diagram here will show you. This was this was what was going on. So you know, it, 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 you, these are the two high bays that are facing towards the launch pad. So at one point, you probably had you had Apollo 10, Apollo 11, or excuse me, Apollo uh, 9, Apollo 10, and Apollo 11 all being tested at the same time, um, and they were you know they were prepared to to be able to to launch a lot of those things uh, if they needed to do them. So when Apollo 11 was rolled out to the launch, uh, when Apollo 11 flew to the moon, Apollo 12 and 13 were already sitting in the high bays here, ready to be checked out. 
So here's, here's kind of the checkout of, this is the third stage being checked out. We've got these big work platforms. These are still, these work platforms are still in the BAB. You can still see Apollo era hardware sitting in the BAB right now. And I asked somebody, why, you know, why do they still have them there? He said, well, it costs too much money to take them out. They're not, they're not in anybody's way, so why not just leave them in there? So, um, so you still got these huge pieces of steel in there. This was a, an interesting uh, a, a piece of equipment here. This is a water tank. They fill with, with, with water to use as ballast, and this is for training the crane operators. So you had, a, you, had two set, you had two cranes. You had one that ran the length of the building, and then you had one that went across the high bays. And the guy that was running the one in the high bay would be sitting up 530 feet off the ground. No television, no remote, no remote TV cameras. He's on the walkie-talkie with a guy that's down on the floor. The training for this was you wanted the crane operator 500 feet up in the air to be able to raise and lower this, to be able to lower it onto an egg that you couldn't pull the egg out and, and it didn't crack, or to also be able to operate the nozzle of a paint can by raising and lowering the crane, uh, the, this ballast tank. That's the degree of precision. Again, this was all manually done. It was not computer controlled. So some pretty sophisticated cranes that they had back then. They've been upgraded since that. <laughs> they still use that ballast tank for testing. It's still there. So here's, here's uh, the first stage of a Saturn V arriving. Um, for those of you who know what the vehicle ended up looking like, there's still a lot of stuff missing, like the extension nozzles are missing from there. There's no uh, bearings over here. There's no retro rockets and stuff. That's all going to be installed once it's, once it's added into the uh, once it's been uh, put in, into the, uh, the launch pad area. So here's the, they raise it up. There's a diaphragm that's 110 feet off the ground, excuse me, it's 16 stories off the ground. So they raise it up to go across that diaphragm 16 feet up in the, uh, 16 stories up in the air, and then they lower it down onto the, uh, the mobile <laughs> launcher platform. Here's a, a picture I like. This is, so this is the base of the Saturn V on the launcher platform. There's guys inside the engine department, and they're working on the engine. Uh, another thing I didn't appreciate about the Saturn V was that the engines had insulation that were added onto it. This is all, um, this is real heavy uh, aluminum uh, batted insulation. It's strung together with, with Inconel wire. And this all had to be manually sewed on at the, you know, in the vehicle assembly building. It was about 1,200 hours to sew on these insulation battings around the engine once the engine assembled. And somebody told me what a nasty job that was. It really cut your hands up, if you can imagine, using wire to sew up um, uh, engine insulation like that. Some of the stories that came out of doing these interviews were great. This was something I was not aware of before. This is called the S1, the S2 spool, or the, uh, the spacer. Uh, the, the, the last of the stages to get perfected in the Saturn V was the second stage, was the S2 stage. And um, it was a very complex design that required like a single bulkhead between the liquid ho oxygen and liquid hydrogen tanks. And Rockwell was not ready for the first uh, testing of this when it was going to be done. So what they did instead, they didn't want to delay the assembly of, and testing of the Saturn V, so they sent the spacer instead. This is, it's the same size as the S2 stage on both ends, and they just ran the wires through it. So they just put it in in place of the second stage of the rocket. That's what it looks like stacked up on here. This was a temporary, a temporary testing thing until the actual second stage arrived. But they said there was no end of the contractors always looked for ways to, to make fun of each other. And so, you know, the, the Boeing guys would say, "Hey, Rockwell, nice, nice rocket you got." There. <laughs> so eventually, the second stage did arrive, and here it is coming in and being lowered in on top of the first stage, and then the uh, the, the the uh, S4B stage comes in and it's bolted on top. Uh, this is, this is a, a bunch of guys from IBM standing around inside the top of the, of the S4B stage. This is the instrument unit coming in. So the instrument unit was like the brains of the Saturn V. It had all the navigation equipment and the computers and things. And so the IBM guys were in charge of this instrument unit and they were bolting that on top. Uh, the, the guy who was the site manager from IBM at the time told me he said it was hard to find IBM people who would, who would qualify themselves as wrench turners because you had to attach all these bolts and, and things to it to put on there, but, but uh, nonetheless that happened. What's the stage? S4 stage that had six engines on the bottom of it. It was not with hydrogen and oxygen. So this was a modified second stage, or third stage. 
Here's, uh, this is the spacecraft command, and what I love about this is so you're looking up at the lunar module, and you can see it's, um, it's still got a lot of plastic on it, and uh, I love this angle because you can also see there's work platforms up inside this, uh, this part of the thing. So you could still access all parts of the spacecraft while the, while the uh, thing was at the launch pad or while it was <coughs> at the, uh, at the uh, vehicle assembly building. So they had those work platforms in there. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Ron Evans, who was the command module pilot for Apollo 17. This is the inside of the area. This is the engine for the S-4B. So he's inside the area between the third stage and the second stage, talking to one of the McDonnell Douglas technicians. And there were, you can see the work platforms inside here. Um, so there was lots of room inside this rocket. This, the, the, the interstage between the first two stages was two stories high. So there was plenty of room for people to get inside and work on the engines and do other work inside. <laughs> One of the great stories that somebody told me was, he said, uh, one day, you know, out at the launch pad, it's lunchtime, everybody's supposed to be getting off of work, and I see a bunch of technicians who are walking across the swing arm to get into the interstage area, and I, he said, I got kind of suspicious, I was wondering what was going on because people were supposed to be off for lunch. He said, so I, I walked across the swing arm, and I went in there, and the guys had set up a car table, and they were playing hearts in there. Uh, it was a nice air-conditioned place out in the middle of uh, Florida summertime. And so, you know, they were just in there playing hearts at lunchtime. But that's how much room they had inside the rocket up there. Uh, this is another guy that's inside the, uh, inside the rocket. This is during a test. He's got his procedure in front of him. And, and what he's running here is what was called a, a, a stage separation simulator. So you had, you had electrical wires that were connecting all of the stages together. And so what this guy was doing is, this is a simulated countdown, at the point of the stage where the stages, or the point in the, in the flight where the, where the stages would have separated, he pushes a button and it manually pulls apart the electrical connectors between the two stages, and you see it, if the electronics continue to work. So that's, that's uh, another somebody working inside the, uh, the spacecraft. One of the, the most unusual tests I saw was this one, and some of you may have seen this one uh, floating around. It took me a long time to figure out what was going on here. This is one of the unmanned Saturn V's. Actually, I think this was the facility's test vehicle. And um, this is up at the, uh, the second and third, or up, up near the spacecraft level area. You had one level of people with ropes attached to the top end of the spacecraft and people kicking uh, the next level down and seeing how much the spacecraft vibrate. What they're actually testing is this, this red thing right here, which turns out to be it's an inertial, I mean, a dampening system. Is that part of the gantry here? It was, it was part of the gantry, yeah. The idea was that even in extreme wind conditions, you know, you can imagine a moment arm of this thing that's 363 feet tall. The wind's blowing, the top of it's going to go back and forth like crazy. Um, the idea was with this dampening system was that the, the top of the escape tower was not supposed to move more than the, the distance of about a basketball. So uh, this, this system ended up getting replaced by a different system. Yeah, one of the other tests that somebody told me about was that we, they called it the Tinkle Test. He said we got, we got a Saturn S2 stage in and in the process of checking it out we discovered somebody had left a wrench inside one of the fuel tanks. And we said, what we decided to do at that point, because it said, once you get it up, stacked on there, you have to take the whole thing apart to get into the fuel tank area. He said, we did what we called the tinkle test, which was to pick it up and turn it around, and if we heard any banging around inside, we knew there was something loose in there. Yeah. Uh, I, I love the, this one for a sense of scale. This is Apollo 11 as it's about to roll out of the launch pad, and so, uh, out to the launch pad. So, you know, again, this is, this is a launch platform that's attached that goes out and sits onto the launch pad. The vehicle is assembled on top of that, and you've got the, uh, the gantry going up the side of that. And this massive thing is sitting on the crawler transporter down here, which takes it out to the launch pad at about one mile an hour. But again, just the scale of this thing is amazing. They, they reused these launch platforms for the space shuttle program. Uh, I'll talk about this opening here in a, in a couple of minutes. So that's, remember this opening, because this has got special significance. So here's the, uh, the Apollo uh, Saturn V being taken out to the launch pad. It's just about into position. You know, we're used to seeing the Saturn V looking like this, which is, you know, the rocket standing next to the gantry. But what a lot of the pictures that we see nowadays does, uh, don't include is this ungainly thing, which was called the mobile service structure. 
And this was basically was a way for people to, to it was a, two functions was to, was to protect the spacecraft, also to install the explosives on the side of the spacecraft that would blow it up if anything went wrong. Um, one of the, this is a, one, of my, one of my petting zoo things from the Apollo program. This is, this is a range safety encoder. This is one of the few classified pieces of information on the Saturn V. Uh, they would send a radio command to this to, to, to explode shape charges that ran the full length of the spacecraft before this full length of the launch vehicle if it went bad. And so this, this plug goes into it. So this plug is unclassified until it's been coated with pins. You put pins in there to, to put in a special, a special code. This was to keep the Russians from blowing up a Saturn V after it had taken off. <laughs> so, but, you, but you still wanted to have the ability to be able to blow one up yourself. Uh, so anyway, this, this ungainly device, this thing weighed more than the Saturn V, the launch tower, and the, and the mobile platform all together. But there's, a, there's like a little cocoon up here that the spacecraft is, is protected by, and then these little things can move up and down. The people who wrote in this thing said it was, it was the most terrifying thing they ever did, because it was an open cage elevator, and it takes you up 500, uh, 500 feet in the air. And they said the thing was prone to just stopping at random and the doors opening and then you're just looking, looking out into another. <coughs> a lot of these guys said that they tended to ride sitting down or lying down. It's pretty scary. This is, what, this is what you would normally see at most of the time when a, an Apollo mission was out at the launch pad because now you can see that the rocket is pretty well covered up by the mobile service structure and the, uh, uh, and the rest of it. It's, it's, been a, it's been amazing trying to find pictures of things like this because it's not very, it doesn't show up in the, it's not as glamorous as looking at the Life magazine photos. So this was the only picture I was able to find on the inside of it. And this was only through having to do a lot of a digital manipulation of the image. But there's all kinds of pipes and hoses and things. What they do is they, they do all the fueling for the hypergolic batons and things are done from inside these platforms. And you can also get to the, there's the white room that you can get to either through the launch gantry tower or through this side of things. Here's another picture of the inside of it. These are, uh, these are the two oxygen tanks being installed in Apollo 14 after the Apollo 13 accident. The redesigned oxygen tanks. But that's, that's what that, the inside of that looked like. And so that's when, when they were doing work on the spacecraft out of the pad, this is, this is kind of the conditions that we're working in. Uh, you know, I mentioned the work platforms around the uh, lunar module before, and this was a, a drawing that I kind of put together from a couple different sources. But they had these these platforms all around. You could get inside and work on the batteries, or go inside the uh, the, the front of the lunar module and work on any part of it that you needed to. Uh, it was pretty tight quarters in there. There were only um, you could only get three or four people in there at a time. They had a, a system called cookie cutters. And once the thing was loaded, if there was a propellant spill, you hit the button and it blew a hole in the side of, um, of the adapter module and then you could jump out of that hole. Obviously, if you did that, the whole thing has to go back to the uh, launch pad. So you got cooker, cookie cutter training, but you were told never to activate the cookie cutter unless you're the life threat, threatening emergency. So this is, a, so here's a, a, a picture that you have not seen before if you've not seen my books. Um, after Apollo 10, so Apollo 10 launched in May of 1969, and two days later, Apollo 10 had not even gotten to the moon, and Apollo 11 had already been rolled out to the launch pad. That's how the schedule was going at the time. Uh, and as Apollo 10 was doing its mission, Neil Armstrong uh, looked at the flight plan, and he said, you know, the flight plan is that when we fly the lunar module down, when as soon as we get the contact light, we're supposed to cut the engine, and the thing is going to fall 10 feet to the ground. He said. I'm a pilot. I'm flying my thing all the way down to the ground. I don't want to cut it off and then have it drop. And so they had not they had not designed the thermal protection system on the bottom of the lunar module in a way to, to accommodate that. So they, they made the executive decision to add 39 pounds of insulating foil to the bottom of the lunar module legs at the launch pad. In doing that, what that required was another uh, 16,000 pounds of fuel or they'd have to find another 130 or another 39 pounds of something to come from somewhere else on the vehicle. But this this gentleman here, um, uh, who looks kind of hot and, and flustered, was the guy who was in charge of putting that on there. He said basically his tool, his toolbox had a bunch of his cap time tape and, and scissors. That was about what he what he took out there. They weighed his toolbox before he went into the lunar module. They weighed it when he came out so they could tell how many pounds of foil and insulation he put on there. 
but he was out there, uh, you know, putting insulation around the leg of the lunar module, and he said that this guy came by and said, "Hey, kid, you want your picture taken?" And so he took his picture and he shared that with me for the, for the book. So uh, when you see the picture, of, there's a picture of uh, Buzz Aldrin on the moon, kind of staring at uh, the leg of the lunar module, and that's the leg there that eventually ended up covered in gold foil. Uh, here's. Two guys from Grumman inside the uh, lunar module. This is uh, just before launch. This is within within a day of launch. They're installing the plaque on the front leg of the lunar module, like the one that would say we came in peace for all mankind or whatever. So you can see how, how tight the, uh, the area is. This is the wall of that, uh, that adapter thing there, lying on a platform, which will then be taken out if the platform doesn't fly into space. This is the white room. For Apollo 14. So this is where the astronauts would come in and go into the, the command module. And I, you know, I like this picture of this guy up here in the fog. Uh, this was in January 1971, and you know it looks kind of peaceful up there. Here's the same view um, from Apollo 8, and you can see this guy is he's more than 400 feet off the ground, sitting on top of the white room. Uh, we talking to the people who had to work up there, they, they said, of course, that was always the initiation for the new guy was to take him up on the, uh, the top of the gantry the first day out there and just watch how terrified people were. Uh, so they go into there, and you remember I told you to remember that, that opening. Well, here's the opening attaches to this, this thing right here. And um, this is a tunnel which leads down into the launch pad into an area called the rubber room. And if there were ever a mishap on the launch pad, the idea was that the astronauts would run, it would run across. This is while the vehicle is fully fueled. The astronauts would run across to the elevator, take the high-speed elevator down into the mobile launch platform, jump into this tube, and it takes them into a blast room in the bottom of the uh, under all this concrete at the bottom of the launch pad. And so uh, here's a here's an actual video of the of the rubber room in in practice. So you you hop into this tube and, and slide down through there and then come out onto this, uh, <laughs> onto this thing. So this is a BBC reporter. Okay. Um, he's, he looks relatively unscathed. He goes into this big blast room, which has got like a uh, missile silo grade type of door on there. And you go into this, this room, which is mounted on springs. So if there's an explosion above you, you and uh, 20 of your closest friends can sit there in these chairs for a day and uh, be protected from that. Hmm. Here's what the rubber room looked like. This was, uh, I got a chance to go there about six years ago. It was in really bad shape. This is the one at, at, uh, at Launch Complex 39A. Uh, originally, when they were testing it out, they had the guys uh, get on a, on a Teflon sheet and slide down that, and they tried even putting water on that. And so one guy came through so fast that he hit the far wall and broke his leg in six places. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, that's, that's the rubber the rubber ramp there was supposed to slow you down and not speed you up. You saw the guy came through pretty slowly at the end there. And so this is the this is the door to the blast room. And uh, again, not, not much to see there now. There's a, a nice uh, bathroom facility here with a shower curtain behind you. you when you deemed it was safe to go out, you could crawl through this tunnel. You could walk through this tunnel out to the uh, edge of the, of the pad. And they said that snakes and alligators and things like to hang out in there. So you just kind of take your chances with that. They ended up with a slot, with, you know, deciding that if there was a problem with fuel spilling out of the vehicle, you probably didn't want to ride an elevator down through that. And so they came up with a slide wire system. And this was also the result of tests. Originally, we were going to have like T bars that the astronauts could hang on to. <laughs> and uh, one of the guys I was talking to said, he said, when they were testing this on the roof of the VAB, they had run a slide wire down the, the, the roof of the VAB, and he said, this guy had a, you know, one of those big uh, industrial laundry carts full of, of mannequins and dummies. And he said, they were, you know, were going up and testing these things out. He said, over the course of the week, those things started missing arms and legs and heads. <laughs> and he said, I really didn't want to, didn't want to try that. So. Uh, uh, fortunately, they, they ended up with this system that would carry up to six people, and they only tested this one time. Um, this was uh, another hazard at the launch pad. So uh, during the, uh, the fueling of Apollo 13, when they were doing the countdown test uh, at night, uh, uh, some of the security cars were, were driving around, and they noticed a suspicious-looking uh, cloud. 
and so they went over to check it out. They parked the cars there, looked around, didn't see anything. The uh, lead security guy turned on his ignition, and a piston flew through the through the uh, hood of his car, and the car immediately exploded and melted, as did two other cars. Uh, they were sitting in a cloud of, uh, of gaseous oxygen. It, it was it was liquid oxygen had been poured onto the ground and was evaporating, so they were sitting in a pure oxygen cloud. Luckily, nobody was hurt or killed in that, but the, the guys in the firing room said they were watching it on, on closed circuit TV and having a good laugh at the security guard's expense. But uh, yeah, again, the hazards of working at the launch pad. Somebody would say, said, oh, it's, it's great because you'd see like these little bubbles of, of liquid oxygen kind of rolling across the ground and you could, you could step on them and make a big pop and then there was somebody blew part of his foot off doing that one time. So uh, yeah, it, it was a dangerous environment. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about computers, and I, I did say, you know, we did have computers back then, and this is, these were the ones that filled up entire rooms. Uh, this is one of the circuit boards from the launch control computer. This is one of them here, too, so this is a uh, four-bit flip-flop. Okay, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is another one, okay? So, the, the launch computer had a total of 32K of memory and 32K of drum memory. Uh, this is a this is a 256 byte nest, uh, uh, 256 bytes, okay, of memory uh, memory card. There you can see a roller to get an idea how big this thing was. Um, the the real sexy electronics were reserved for the the command and service module and the lunar module. But that at one point NASA had I would say the majority of the semiconductors that were being made were being used for the command and service module. The stuff on the ground was using this. Uh, uh, very early, I mean, there's no integrated circuits on here at all. This is just uh, capacitors and transistors and diodes. And of course, punch cards, we all remember, a lot of us remember punch cards, and this is how the data was entered. This is, this is inside the mobile launcher. So they had a computer inside, the, they had a full room computer inside the firing room that was connected by data cables to a, a another uh, computer that was out in the launch uh, platform which then sent everything out to the rest of the uh, spacecraft and the, and, the, uh, and the ground service equipment by relays. So this is what the data input keyboard looked like. Uh, the firing room had 400 and some stations there. It was kind of like a, a, a physical organization chart. This is where the brass, top brass sat, and then the supervisor sat farther down, and then you had all the lead engineers sitting in this area, and then these are all like, um, uh, Printout racks and things like that, and this whole back room here is the computer. Uh, one of the, the big innovations of this was the invent of or the, the uh, beginning of automation on here, and, and you'll see a lot of these panels if you look at them have an on, auto, and off. And the idea was that you really wanted the engineers to leave the thing in auto, which means that the computer would control what was going on. If an engineer flipped a switch on or off, it would immediately stop the, the test program. Uh, and the engineers wanted to make sure they had that ability to be able to do on, auto, and off. They, they wanted to have control over that. During the Apollo 11, if you compare the Apollo 11 countdown to the Apollo 17 countdown, where they trusted the computer more and more, uh, they ended up with many, many fewer pages in the test manual and three hours of extra time built into the, of, of free time built into the Apollo 17 launch. Oh, I mentioned relays. This is this is a relay monitor. <coughs> there are eight relays on this, and so the, a command would come from the computer and it would flip a, a relay open or closed. And so there were banks and banks of these. There were hundreds of these, about 700 of them, out on the mobile launcher, and they were plugged into cabinets like this. The wires came in, and uh, the way you programmed these was this way. <laughs> this is a holdover from the, the telephone industry. But you, it was easier to do the patch panels than it was to try to rewire. Uh, this, is, this is a control panel from the Launch Control Center. And there was no uh, automation that you know, allowed multi-purpose workstations. So you had, um, you had, everybody had their own thing. This, one, this was the firing command uh, from this was used in the uh, Apollo Soyuz and the Skylab man launches. But let me show you a little bit about here's what the firing room looked like. This is the Apollo 8 countdown demonstration test. So you see all these engineers. You get Boeing down at the bottom. That's, these are Boeing guys here looking at the first stage. Uh, 
and it's just checking everything out. There's, it's all switches, dials, and lights. Dedicated lights for everything. The computer basically just started and stopped programs, that were test programs that were running. These are the, uh, the, the uh, engine engineers for the second stage. Checking this out. So there's 30 stations and five rows of these things, and then all the supervisors sitting behind them, and then all the people in the back rooms and things. So every, again, every light is hardwired. Of course, you take your cigarettes in there with you. And, and there were, there were um, and you can see that the average age there was probably in the, in the late 20s. A lot of these guys you know, talked about being hired right out of college. In some cases, before they even graduated from college, they'd drive down and get a job offer. Um, there was another room that, that, that uh, we never ever see. This is called the ACE room, the automated checkout equipment room. This, is, this controlled the spacecraft, and this was over in the operations and checkout building. There was one of these for the command module and one for the lunar module. As far as we know, there's never been a movie taken inside this room. We were, I've been talking to some of the lead engineers that were there, and we were, we've been trying to find even photographs of them because they just didn't do anything. These, this is a posed photograph of GE engineers as they were commissioning the, the, the uh, room. Uh, this is a page from the launch countdown. Again, everything is printed out, uh, scripted. Uh, if there are any changes to the launch, uh, launch program, it's all handed out to everybody in the uh, room configuration control. Uh, when you get down to the last couple seconds of the, the last three minutes of the count, what would happen to the engineer with this guy here would push at the right time, T minus three minutes and 30 seconds, he pushed the firing command button and wait until he saw that the computer had picked that up, the light would go on that the computer was picking up. You slide your hand down, you hold your thumb over the emergency cutoff button, <laughs> and you pray to God that no red lights go on between you know, T minus three minutes, 30 seconds, and zero. Because he is one of two guys that can stop the countdown. This is a launch sequencer that's running here. And this was, this was all automated with, it's, it's all diodes and again relays to make things work. Simple is better for, for things. And I just wanted to show you this one interesting thing I noticed. I was wondering, you know, I, I saw this spring on the side of the Saturn V and wondered what the heck that was. And somebody was pointing out to me, okay, so here's the string. You know, it's attached to the top of one of the hold-down arms covers. And so this is a slow motion view of liftoff of the Saturn V. So you'll see these, these two swing arms come up. And this hold-down arm, there are four of these that are holding the thing down. You want to protect the inside of it. So what happens is the vehicle lifts off, the string pulls tight, and just it pulls up the back of the hood and it comes down. So there's no, no uh, machinery or automation making that happen. It's done strictly by gravity and the force of, of that lanyard being pulled. Huh. But this is the inside of the launch platform during a, a space shuttle launch. So you can see you know, the, the equipment's all shock mounted. And you can see what, what's going on inside there. Uh, you see it from another angle. The Saturn V launch would have taken a lot longer because the vehicle was a lot slower to get off the launch pad. But uh, there's not a place you would probably want to be inside. The, uh, the decibel level at the, at the deck level was, someone estimated, somewhere around 180 to 190 decibels. Just, you know, and that, yeah, it, it, it was enough to start ripping the air apart, actually. Four years. Yeah. So, that's, yeah, so that's, that's what the inside of the launch platform looked like. Um, this was a picture taken right after the Apollo 11 launch. And, and, uh, the caption you usually see says that these people are anxiously watching the launch of Apollo 11. But in talking to the guys that, um, that were there, like this is Norm Carlson, the launch, uh, launch test conductor we were talking to, he said, you know, he's out of position, and a lot of these other guys are out of position. And it turned out when I looked at the clocks back here that this is an hour and some minutes after liftoff. They're, they're listening to Spiro Agnew, <laughs> who was down there to give a speech. The but one person I want you to notice in the very back here is Miss Joanne Morgan. She was the only woman in the launch room during the, uh, during the Apollo 11 launch. And you saw, if you saw that Apollo 11 documentary, the IMAX documentary, she was in that. She's a, she's a wonderful person, um, the first of many female engineers at NASA, and uh, just, just a fascinating person to talk to. This was how they figured out what this is. This is the, the, the feedback they got on how the launch was going. They had a, a computer called the D6 that printed out and the data on the left-hand side is all you got. You didn't get this 
this, this information on the right, but it just showed the state of every relay that, was, that changed during the course of the countdown. So they'd go back and analyze these numbers and figure out what happened during the countdown. What they found in the, in the Skylab 2 launch, which I didn't know about, was that, you know, I mentioned these relays, one of them, when the launch emit signal was given, the relay opened and then it closed again and it bounced. And uh, it created a sneak circuit situation that they weren't aware about. And what it was, what it, what had happened was that that closed relay thought that there had been a launch failure, and so the closed relay tried to shut down all the electrical power inside the launch vehicle. And so, it, had that happened just a few milliseconds later, you would have had a vehicle going on full power. There was no electricity needed to run the vehicle except to steer it. So you would have had a fully powered vehicle flying with no ability to be able to steer it or to blow it up because the launch control, the uh, range safety system was also tied into the electrical mm -hmm. power system. So they didn't find that out until the next day when they went back and looked at that and they said, you know, their faces just went white as sheets as they realized what had almost happened. Uh, you know, obviously they, they, they built around that the next time out, but uh, it's just, it, it's amazing that we launched as many people as we did, as safely as we did. The Saturn V had, as they, you know, there were a few things where it was less than optimal, but it still had the perfect safety record. Uh, the last people I wanted to talk about were, were folks that were the, uh, they had uh, what they call forward observers. And these were guys who were on the launch team who, who were more than a mile closer to the launch pad than anybody else was. And they were, they had, uh, Binoculars, and they were watching the color of the flame and the angle at which the rocket was taking off. And if they saw anything weird, they were supposed to get on their walkie-talkies and call back and say, you know, abort or, or destruct or something like that. But they were they were very close. They said if anything happened, they had a, they had a, a culvert they were supposed to jump into. And um, originally, when it was built, they said that the problem was it was lined up exactly with the launch pad, so the fire would have been blowing wide open. <laughs> so, there's so it was sideways at least, but they said the other problem was that alligators and snakes and things like to get in there, so they really hoped they didn't have to jump into it at the very end. Uh, but they, they obviously had the best seat in the house, and I really uh, admire uh, that they were able to do something like that. I, never, I, I regret that I never got a chance to see a Saturn V launch. But uh, I did tell you, it was sure fine when I was a kid watching these things on TV. But I wanted to say I, I neglected to bring copies of my books with me, but if you're interested in them, uh, the best way to reach me is through apollolaunchcontrol at gmail.com.